Greetings, everyone. Thank you for being with us again this Friday evening. Today, it's all about Polk Audio and the Polk design philosophy. Joining us today are our very own top guys at Polk Audio, Scott Orth, Director of Audio and Acoustics at Sant United, based in East Coast, Baltimore, and our Michael Greco, who is the Senior Director of Category Management Loudspeakers at Sound United, who is based in the West Coast in Vista, California. Welcome, gentlemen. Happy you, you could all make it, and thanks for making time. I am Pleasure Frederick, and I'm joining you from Hong Kong. Hosting from his lovely home theater is Phil Jones, our director in our training director in Carlsbad, San Diego. Over to you, Phil. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. It's Phil again, and today I have some special um, friends. Me, Mike and I used to sit next to each other for a couple of years, and I learned a lot from the dude. So I wanted to bring him as well as Scott, the big brain behind Polk Audio, to talk about um, Polk. Because if you look at brands and speakers, each brand has their own kind of distinct look. And that has to do more than just cosmetics. There's different approaches that speaker manufacturers take to achieve the goals that they are looking for. There's different ways to climb a mountain or a hill. And each manufacturer has their own ideas on what's the best approach. So I brought Mike and Scott to talk about Polk Audio today. So before we even get started about the speaker itself, um, Mike, could you give us a little bit of a history about the brand? Sure. Um, so Polk Audio um, has been around for almost 50 years, and it was started in 1972 by a gentleman by the name of Matthew Polk. So that's where the name comes from. And he got his start because he had friends and bands, and they were looking for sound reinforcement speakers. And so he built them some sound reinforcement speakers. And they realized, though, that um, that it was one of those things where that was not something they could continually do because everything was a custom and a one-off. So um, small group of them got together there were three in total and they actually started uh they built their first commercial speaker which which was the monitor uh seven and they uh, introduced that in 1974 and since then they've been building anything that makes sound um matt has matt's no longer with the business but um uh, the legacy continues and one of the things that's interesting about polk and we'll talk a little bit about this and like and for example scott's here is there has been a consistent chain in terms of people that have either that have been part of that engineering group that have um uh that that for the Polk sound. So in other words, um, from Matthew Polk to Stu and now to Scott, they're, all these folks work together. So Scott actually worked with Matt. So there's a level of consistency with Polk. And so um, it's like I said, we're going on our 50th anniversary in uh, 2022. So it's pretty exciting. Um, and uh, you know, Polk is um, in the United States, it's the number two uh, speaker brand. Yes, because I've been working at retail for a year. For, I worked at retail for several years before I started working for manufacturers. And one of my go-to brands was always Polk because the performance and the bang for the buck um, was exceptional. It, was, it could always punch way above its weight class when it came to performance. It looked good. It was built well. And it was always um, something that many, many customers have gravi gravitated to. And as a salesperson, if a lot of customers like it, that's what I'm going to show. And it's always been that way when it comes to Polk. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about um, the idea behind um, what are their goals at Polk, as well as what are the technologies that are unique to Polk that they, are, that they, have, that they have developed to try to achieve those goals. There's a whole lot of different models available in the Polk lineup, but we figured we'd focus on the Polk Legend series. Why? Because it it basically, as probably, as Scott will probably say, that's his. Um, it represents all of the latest technologies and the latest advancements that are available in a in a Polk speaker. So so Scott, let's talk about your philosophy when it comes to building a speaker. And there's a couple of different things that you brought up to me um, when it came to different things that you are striving to achieve. And one of them like, uh, was tone. Can you explain what you mean by tone? So tone is, uh, in, a, in a more uh, technical term, would be like spectral balance. This mm -hmm. is the, the, the lows and the highs, making sure everything is balanced across the frequency uh, range. That's mm -hmm. what we refer to when we're talking about tone. Okay. Okay, so yeah, so just evenly all the way through. Um, That's right. We, now, we, stri we strive to make it as, as even as possible, as pleasing as possible. We don't want to have any 
uh, resonances or any uh, certain areas of the spectrum kind of poking out so that it draws your attention to it. We want it, we want it to be nice and, and smooth. Well, well, the question I have to you about uh, for you about tone is um, we talk about even smooth frequency response. Every speaker is plus or minus three dB, but they all sound different. Can you explain why that is? You know, uh, well, uh, for starters, they're not plus or minus three dB, <laughs> uh, all of them. Uh -huh. And yeah, you could take a, a specification like that and say, okay, I want it to be perfectly flat from this frequency to this frequency plus or minus dB, and you can make an infinite amount of speakers that all sound different in that same specification. Yeah, yeah, because that's what we we stress that a lot is you can't just use a spec to buy a speaker because there's so many other things going on dispersion, how it interacts with your yeah. room, and everything. Yeah, it's else. not telling you much. It's not telling you much. You have to really listen to them. Um, the next one is time. What is? What do you mean by time? So time uh, is kind of the flip side of frequency. If you're if you're a, a math nerd anyway. Um, and so in the time domain, we're concerned with things like um, pacing of the music, the, uh, the impacts of, of instruments. You know, you got these, uh, you know, especially percussion, that kind of thing, making sure they've, they've uh, got good impact to them. And, and this is also where resonances can come into play, because if you have a resonance, what's happening is you're, you're hitting the, the speaker with the signal and it's absorbing some sound and then radiating it after that actually happens. So there's this ringing or decay that, that we want to try to avoid because it tends to smear the imaging or, or make a sibilant sounds or just, you know, in, in resonate in general, it's trying, something okay. we're trying to avoid. Okay, okay. Um, the, the other thing too is sometimes, um, I, was at, I was curious when we talk about time, sometimes you'll see a speaker kind of angled back, you know, like the tweeters further away than the woofer. Sure. You know, is that yep. is that something that they're doing to attempt to improve the timing? That um, why did why did they do that? Because I've heard it's you know time you know that they that they use that for timing. Does what yeah. does that do? is that so? One of the yeah, so you in, like let's just take a two-way speaker for example, like a bookshelf speaker. You've got a tweeter and a and a and a woofer. The acoustic centers of those two things uh, are not in the same place physically in the transducer. So the tweeter is going to be very close to the to the bottom of the dome. Mm -hmm. And for the driver, it's very close to the to the to the neck of the voice coil there where it attaches to the cone. Mm -hmm. So those two points in space are not aligned. Mm -hmm. So they're a little different, right? So that means that the highs are going to come out a little quicker than the lows. Mm -hmm. So when you're tilting it back, you're trying to get those things to come back into alignment so that mm -hmm. the highs and the lows are, are starting at the same point. Okay. Okay. That that makes sense. We talk about specs. Everybody loves their specs, right? So the first thing is the frequency response, and then also they use that frequency response to determine the bandwidth. Can you talk about what they mean? What what bandwidth is? So bandwidth refers to how high in frequency and how low in frequency it will go. So typically, you see things like human hearing is roughly twenty to twenty kilohertz, right? Mm -hmm. So a loudspeaker that can cover that entire range you know, theoretically is completely full range. So we try, we strive to have the, strive to have the widest bandwidth we can in, in, a, in the package and, and space and, you know, price that we, we can afford. So that's what we're going for there. Yeah, so, so good bass, good highs. Um, so you cover that's most right. of the music. But Michael, you yes, could sir. tell the story about sometimes bandwidth, what they say on the box is not really what um, what you get because you have to take in. Um, we have John on the on the line hiding in the background, our acoustic um, expert. But we talk about the fact that it's the how the speaker interacts in the room has a big effect on the, the on its actual bandwidth. This bandwidth on the, there's the spec on the box. And then there's the spec in the room. Can you talk about that experience we had with a competitor speaker a few a few days ago? We're not gonna we're not gonna um, blow up their spot, but we can talk about the experience of of what happened there. Yeah. So I mean, the the, the we live in an industry where there's not a lot of standards, right? And so and the consumer we find is always looking for something to help them figure out what's the best, right? What's the best? And the problem with that is that speakers are like food or wine or, or or beer, it's all about personal taste. And so mm -hmm. the spec isn't going to tell you how it sounds. So what, and, and again, a lot of the specs that you see on boxes, there are no measurements next to them. So you mm -hmm. often will see 
like if you look at legend we'll tell you we'll say this is what the frequency response is basically 3 db down meaning that if you measure it you go down 3 db this is what it looks like and 10 db down so we'll tell you what that is but when you don't see that measurement spec it leaves a lot that you can do so you can say oh this thing plays down to 20 hertz and it plays up to 40 kilohertz and everything in between and then and so the example that you're referring to is we were uh, we're building a new line of speakers, which I can't talk about, which we'll talk about more <laughs> next year sometime, but it's very cool. And we were benchmarking at, and, and that we were also uh, benchmarking this competitor against an existing line of speakers. Mm -hmm. And um, on their packaging, they say they play to a certain frequency. And so we basically played a test tone at that frequency. It was 40 hertz mm -hmm. and you didn't get much sound at 40 hertz. So <laughs> um, it's an example of where, you know. Yes, it did it make sound? It absolutely made sound. Not a lot of sound though. So again, that's the point is that specs are are, are uh, interesting to look at, but they don't tell you what it's going to sound like. Um, yeah, it's almost like you, go yeah, ahead, go ahead. Mike. I was going to say it's almost like the only specs are useful if you're trying to compare a speakers in a series. <laughs> well, they're so not even likely... that because because Scott's 100% right, and I learned this. I've only been with the company five years, but the one thing that Scott's kind of beat into me is, Michael, don't get wrapped around the specs, number one. And number two, it's like they can have the same specs, but they sound different. And that's because of the drivers that you use, the cabinet construction, all these types of things. And that's why there's so many choices out there. Because again, you know, Scott will talk about this, but speakers are a series of compromises, right? Mm -hmm. When you basically look at a Polk speaker, Polk is known for good value for money, good sound, mm -hmm. good value. So in order to do that, we have to compromise. And so, um, it, because we can't just throw money at it. If we want to throw money at it, we might have a pair of $80,000 speakers, but mm -hmm. we don't do that. And so that's the challenge. And so you can take a $500 pair of speakers, you can make many different $500 speakers. You can go into Amazon, Best Buy, you can go buy a $500 speaker and you have a lot of choices and they are all going to sound different and they mm -hmm. might have very similar specs. And so that's mm -hmm. the whole point about specs. One thing before we go back to Scott, I just wanted to, you know, you kind of jumped in there talking about different elements of design. It's if I just wanted to frame the whole discussion though, if you, if you, the top of that um, slide, it talked about Polk idea of a good sound is to basically transform the listening space into the performance space. Whether that performance space was a live event, a concert, or, or a studio. And so everything that Scott does is all about achieving that Polk sound, which is supposed to be very transformative. And mm -hmm. so I just, I because you, because you could argue that each one of these things we're talking about, every good speaker designer is going to try to achieve, but, mm -hmm. the, but, but putting them together in a specific way um, is what Polk is all about. And that, and that transforming that space, mm -hmm. some speakers try to be very clinical. Others try to, um, they might be, they, they all are trying to achieve different goals. Polk has always been about feeling like you're in the front row of, of, a, of a concert. And that's always been kind of the vision behind it. And it's very different than, say, other speakers that you might listen to. And that, again, that goes back to your point where they on paper, they might look very similar. But when you get them in home and you listen to them, they sound very different. And that's the wonderful thing about speakers is that it's all about personal choice. Exactly. And and like I said, there's a couple ways you can do it. Like there's even if it was measured and the information is given to you correctly, um, your room is a big impact. John will tell you that from, from um, who's from uh, Acoustic Geometry, who's hiding on the phone, um, as well as um, even um, our friend Jeff from Odyssey will tell you that. So because a lot of times people say, well, I, I have this big speaker. It's full range because it said so on the box. Why did fill in the blank Odyssey or whatever measure it as as not full range and, 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 and set it as small. So here's the thing that you can do. Um, go get a, if you have Spotify title, Cobas, if you go in and you type in a search for test tone generator, you can find a test tone generator and it will play different frequencies, 100 hertz, 80 hertz, um, 60 hertz, 40 hertz. Take that test tone generator and play your speakers and, and see how far they actually play down in your room so if the odyssey says i love your 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 speakers are six feet tall but they still are not full range you need a subwoofer below 40 it's because in your room um uh it only plays down to 40. somebody else's room may play down even lower but right now it's more about how it sounds in your room and you and that's one of those that's another way that you can that we point out don't just buy based on the specs buy based on how the speaker interacts in 
the room. The next thing is um, the one that, I, that I've always been mesmerized, that I love and a good speaker is imaging and immersion. Can you talk about that, Scott? Sure. Uh, this is uh, when you're talking about aiming and imaging and immersion. That's as you can see at the, the the guiding light statement there at the top. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make it feel like you're in the performance space. And what that means is that this the the images are placed in spaces as they were intended to by the artist. So you know if something's on the left, it's on the left. It's mm -hmm. it's got the same image width that we would expect for that instrument or whatever it is they tried to record. Mm -hmm. And then immersion has to do with um, the sense of envelopment that you get from a pair of speakers. So you can design a, a set of speakers such that there's very little interaction with the room and you get a very dry, uh, focused sound, or you can design a speaker such that it maximizes the inner, uh, the interaction with the room, and you get this very big, wide, spacious sound. And uh, you have to very carefully balance those two such that you can maintain the very precise imaging you want, but still have a uh, the seal, uh, feeling of envelopment. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, because I, I love when you play a track and it's literally like a human being or like you're in that venue. You know, if I'm playing a, a recording from like a jazz club, it's cool to have the singers and the different people in the different places in the set and the glass tinkling over here and things like that. And, and you, can hear the, you can hear the ambience of the room. You can tell that that space is, you know, so large. Exactly. It's not huge. Exactly. It's, a, it's a jazz club. It's only, you yeah. know. A few hundred feet in, in dimensions, and you could. And it's a funny thing about it is you can if you can you can you can sense the um the the size of a room without a lot of sound. I've done it where you That's go right. into a large space in your room or go go to a gym and sit there, and then yeah. go into your small closet and close the door. It's not a lot of sound in there, but That's you right. can kind of tell how big it's, that space is. It's know? not just bats that can use echolocation. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see you go into a small closet, Phil. That'll be uh, fun to watch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next one um, that people really gravitate to is dynamic range. So can you sp speak to what that is? So dynamic range is the ability of the speaker to be able to play the quiets and the louds, right? So you want to, if you're listening to, let's say, a, an orchestra, mm -hmm. and the big bass drum gets whacked, and the and the brass section comes and blasts at you, you want to be able to reproduce that that level of of SPL in your mm -hmm. listening space without mm -hmm. any kind of distortion. Mm -hmm. But you also want to be able to play the quiet parts without any noticeable. Uh, mm -hmm. distortions or noise or anything like that as well so you know uh, I don't want to get into numbers but y you definitely want to have a fairly wide range of, of dynamics in your in your loudspeaker and if you've got a little tiny loudspeaker and you're trying to fill up big room with sound with it you're you're gonna have trouble it's just mm -hmm. can't it can't put out the SPL you're gonna need yeah Exactly. So it seems, and that's one of the reasons people go, why a lot of times if you even, you want the larger speaker, not just for the bass response, but the ability of that large speaker to pressurize a room. So when you're playing something like Phil Collins in the air tonight and the drums kick off, you know, you get the impact that he was, that he was really trying to get. So dynamics really does make music or movies impressive from a small, a little cricket to a, a gunshot or a boom in a, in a, in a or even in a video game having that extra that extra dynamic range really makes the experience even better um the next thing universal compatibility what does this mean well so that that just means that the products will play with a wide range of uh electronics you know from past present and future we're just trying to make sure that it doesn't have anything about it that's going to keep it from working well with a bunch of different amplifiers, receivers, and such. Okay. Could there be? Um, I've heard like if you sometimes you hear this is a great speaker, but it's difficult to drive. What do they mm -hmm. mean by that? Well, there's a couple things that that could be going on there. Um, one is that it may have a difficult what we call impedance uh, load to it, and that's it's a little more complicated than what's stated as the nominal impedance that you'll okay. see, which again is another one of those specs that's poorly <laughs> defined and, and just drives me nuts. Uh -huh. But 
if you have a, a very low impedance in your speaker or or a lower impedance combined with a high phase angle, that can be mm -hmm. difficult for some amplifiers to drive. Mm -hmm. Another problem could be if you have a very low sensitivity loudspeaker, it takes a lot of power to get it up to the level that you may want to listen at. So that's a little bit harder to drive. And then the other one is is if you're into tubes, mm -hmm. the, the the impedance of the speaker is going to affect the frequency response because mm -hmm. you know loudspeakers are not a, a a constant impedance load and the output impedance of a tube amplifier typically is very high. So you're going to have interaction between them. So if you've got mm -hmm high peaks in your impedance response, that'll translate into higher peaks in the frequency domain. Okay, that, that, makes, that makes perfect, perfect sense. And the last one, which is very important, um, and um, is quality. Can you talk about quality? Sure, uh, so this is the, the, the part that's not a whole lot of fun, but it, it takes up a lot of engineering time and effort, and that is to make the speaker reliable mm -hmm. and safe and look good for many years, right? So when you buy a Polk speaker, we want you to get it and be amazed at the the uh, the amazing sound and affordable price that you just took and, and just make sure it lasts for many years and uh, is reliable and, 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 you know, safety is always an issue as well. Yeah, and it's Mike's job to get to make sure that you hit all of these different things while still being um, in um, at the price points that are comp that 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 he's trying to uh, that he's trying to achieve. And, and like Mike, what you say it was a it was a um, it's a it's a balancing act, is what you were saying. It's a set of compromises. So even with Legend that you're looking at, right? We had to we make trade offs, right? So we decide: do you put more into how it looks or more into how it sounds? Mm -hmm. Do you spend more on this one component or less? Is that one component going to make enough of a difference for most consumers that it's worth spending money on? And 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 is that consumer going to get the value back on that? So part of what Scott's job does is and his team is, is they, you know, we have it, we set out with this idea and then through the development process, that idea is refined and new ideas might come into it. But the whole point is to make something that sounds best in class. And that sounds very cliche, but it's best in class at that price point. And it, Polk has always strived to do that. And so one of the things you'll notice about Polk is that it doesn't use really exotic materials. There's no beryllium, titanium, Kevlar, diamond, any of that type of stuff, because that all costs a lot of money. Also, you'll notice in the, in the cabinets, they're they're furniture grade veneers. They're mm -hmm. very clean, they're very elegant, but they're also very simple, right? They're not, they don't have a lot of curves mm -hmm. and shapes and extra uh, fixtures of aluminum or whatever it is, because again, what we're doing is we're trying to put as much money as possible into the acoustics so that you get the very, that's how come we wanna say we believe you're getting great value for money and you're getting a great sound because we put a disproportionate amount of the cost of the speaker into the acoustics, whether it's at the drivers, the crossover, mm -hmm. um, and so forth. And you spend a little bit less on how it looks, but we still try to make it look nice because we know it is a piece of furniture that's gonna be in the middle of your room that everybody's mm -hmm. gonna see. So that's what we mean by trade-offs. Um, and we're constantly kind of always pushing it, saying, can we do this better? Can we do this better? Is there a way to do this that isn't gonna add a lot of cost because we believe there's a true benefit to it. And so that's exactly. that's always the challenge that with every speaker development. Exactly, so Mike may want the rosewood stained in dragon's blood, but if he does that, Scott can't use a good capacitor or the same level of tweeter, or he has to skip a bra the, some of the bracing inside of the cabinet to give you the fancy skin. So there, there well, is a serious well, balance this, to that. We'll just remove the tweeter. You don't need the tweeter. <laughs> we'll just let's go with the rosewood. We'll just remove the tweeter. There you okay. go. Okay, so so there are some questions coming up here. Uh, Yuri <laughs> is asking about sensitivity and how the Legend 600 is not very sensitive. So um, when it comes to sensitivity, you, you it's a trade-off like anything else. And the basic trade-off that you have is size, low frequency extension, and sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So at as we said earlier, we're looking for bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So this, the 600 goes really low for its size, mm -hmm. and we trade it off 
the, a little bit of sensitivity to get that. And also uh, another trade-off you have to make sometimes is, is, is linearity of the frequency response. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you've got, if you want to make it louder, sometimes you have to give up a linearity in the, in the, uh, in the frequency domain. And we didn't want to do that. We thought, well, you know, power is pretty cheap. Throw a little bit more power at it. We'll make it flatter. We'll make it more extended. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I can see if you're, like you were saying, Scott, if you have a three watt tube amp, um, sensitivity kind of moves up the ladder a little bit more if you're playing like um, really lively orchestral music, you know, but yeah. um, but when you have a 200 watt per channel or 100, 200 watt per channel or 150 watt per channel receiver, um, that becomes less critical. Well, I think there's a, there's a lot of misunderstanding too. Again, we're back to the lies, damn lies, statistics and specifications as well. <laughs> so I, I, you know, when Legend came out, I, I, I did read a lot about complaints about the sensitivity saying, well, you know, the, it's, it's only 86 dB well, the average loudspeaker is only 87 dB. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are going, well, you know, it's not 90. Well, 90 is rare. It's very mm -hmm. rare. Mm -hmm. The average is about 87. Now, what you may read on the internet may tell you otherwise, mm -hmm. but if you actually go and measure the speakers, you'll find that that they're not that sensitive. They're not 90 dB all over the place. They're 87 yeah. is about the average for loudspeakers. So the the 96, I believe it is, for the L600, mm -hmm. ain't that far off. Yeah, exactly. Now, the other thing, too, that we have to talk about is how loud do you really need it to play in your room? People like the big number, just like they want the car that goes 200 miles an hour so they can drive at 55. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I can't remember right now. What is the ref? There's, it's like a reference level for, like, um, when you go to a movie theater that they play stuff at. It's like, and most people say that's way too loud way too loud um and uh so a lot of times people are only playing it at 90 something db right or maybe 93 db and if you want and and so let's talk about wattage versus sensitivity um if i want to normally theoretically if i want to raise something 3 db how much more power do i have to throw at it scott you have to double the power okay so if one watt is 80 87 as much as 86 all right if I add, if I double that, two watts <laughs> makes it 89, right? Four watts make yeah. it, you know, we're already at 92. Eight watts, you know, so about, so most of the time, yeah. and we do this a lot. I love having the, when we use class A amplifiers, because they will chase you out of the room That's with right. like three watts of power. So, so yeah, a, I've, I've done this, this before where I'll put in uh, like 10 volts of pink noise. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to be in the room with the speaker, exactly. Right? And 10 volts yeah. is is what? It's 10 times so 100. It's 25 watts. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right? So where you need the big power typically are in the peaks, mm -hmm. and uh, and you need big current typically in the low frequencies to 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 push the drivers yeah. around. Exactly. And a lot of times when people, the most demanding when it comes to like crazy low frequencies is normally movies and um, sure. they'll go low enough. And then people throw, a, they have two subwoofers to go along with these guys. So believe me, right. you will never, the difference in sensitivity will not be perceived in a normal room um, play, if you have a halfway decent receiver, which you should have if you're buying a nice set of speakers. So it's all about how you put things into, into perspective. Um, that I really wanted to stress on that. So I think just to add to that is so when we design speakers, Scott and his team is very thoughtful about the type of equipment that will be paired with it, right? So when we, so Scott, so Scott works on everything from Legend to T Series, which is the opening price point product for it's a you know you can buy a pair of bookshelf speakers for hundred dollars, right? Mm -hmm. When he does those things, we imagine what kind of equipment you're going to be using, and so you're probably pairing that with much more modest electronics, much whether it's an AVR or uh, an amplifier. And so as you move up in price, we assume also that you're going to be moving up to more sophisticated electronics that have more power that are more capable. And so um, the other, and so again, we're not at the, at the opening price points, we're very conscientious of that. As we move up, we're, the priority is sound. The priority is quality of sound, right? And giving you that immersive experience. Um, because the assumption is is that you're going to 
that buy the electronics that makes those speakers sound the best. Again, there's, we're in an industry where there's not a lot of standards. And so that allows for a lot of, um, how do we put this delicately? Marketing hyperbole, right? And so, <laughs> you know, it just, you know, and, 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 nice and, and Polk doesn't do that, right? I mean, if you read, like, like if legend, if you read the reviews and you read the reviewers that actually ran their own measurements, they were spot on with what we published. Or in some instances, they said, well, we actually show that it has a higher sensitivity than what they're stating, right? And that's part of what we were doing with Polk is we're just going to tell you how it is. But that's why we don't want you to get caught up in that. We want you to go listen because we think at the end of the day, you'll go, wow, that sounds amazing. And yeah, it might not match exactly your idea of a perfect speaker on paper, but that doesn't really matter. Now, if you look at the speakers, they um, there's things about them that look different, whether it's the cone and the tweeter, things you see, and then there's things that you do not see that have a great, a massive impact on the um, the performance of the speaker. So let's talk about first the common things that you do see that people go, what is that? Scott, can you talk a little bit about the um, pinnacle tweeter. Sure. So the the pinnacle tweeter is it's a good example of 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 evolution of a of a design. <clears throat> so we started with the uh, ring radiator design back in the early 2000s with LSI. Mm -hmm. And this pinnacle tweeter is actually the third generation of that type of tweeter. Mm -hmm. So we we changed quite a few things um, on this last iteration. We changed the dome because we liked the way it sounded a little bit better. Mm -hmm. uh, the material is slightly different than you have in the LSIM. The obviously the uh, the little waveguide in the center was changed there a little bit to improve the high frequency dispersion. Mm -hmm. And we also went in and uh, re-engineered the uh, the cavity and that's behind the dome that provides the primary low frequency resonant chamber for it. And we found that there was a uh, an unwanted resonance back there and we went and, and applied some damping and some other engineering to that to uh, to fix that problem. The little tip on the front is for, helps with its disper, is it dispersion or, or yeah. the little, okay, so there's a reason why it looks like it does. I noticed that there was a question, Frederick, about ribbons. Yes, that's also a question by Yuri, wondering why uh, Paul Cordium is not considering ribbon tweeters. Uh, well, ribbon tweeters have their place. They tend to be pretty expensive. Um, and we did actually play around with uh, ribbon stuff back when we were working on LSI, to, uh, which you might find interesting when during the development phase, we considered ribbon tweeters and, and, and ultimately rejected them um, because they, well, that particular design we were working with just didn't have the dynamic range that we wanted. Mm -hmm. But nothing against ribbon tweeters, but we just don't find it to be the right uh, balance of, of properties for, for what we do. Exactly. As Mike says, it's always a compromise. There is no perfect driver solution. You just have to look at the driver solution that fits most of your goals. But now these things are ba built based on testing. So um, a lot of this stuff, uh, most Polk drivers are, are not bought off the, off the counter. Um, it's based on they, they have a, a, a driver that, um, technology that they like, they work on an evolution of it, and then it is manufactured to meet our specs. So, so what ends up happening is that's why these speakers look different is because the drivers were designed by us to try to get the most out of the particular technology we're using. Would that be a good way of saying it, Scott? Yeah, we don't, we don't use off the shelf parts for anything. We design them to, to meet our needs uh, in, in our, in our facility. I mean, I've, I've, I've used the, uh, the cookie analogy in the past. It's like mm -hmm. When, uh, when we're talking about building a new line of speakers, it's like, yeah, I can go buy a, a, a box of cookies off the shelf or I can bake you some cookies, mm -hmm. right? But so if I bake you the cookies, they're going to be good and they're going to be better. Mm -hmm. If I get you the ones off the shelf, they're going to be quick and fast, but anybody can go and buy that those cookies, right? Exactly. And if you want a really, really good cookie off the shelf, like one of those little stores in the uh, in the uh, in the mall, that cookie costs as much as five boxes of the of the normal cookies you buy in a supermarket. So so off the really good off the shelf is really freaking expensive, versus you know versus you making those cookies yourself and getting the same quality if you did them in your home, um, exactly the way you want those cookies to be. So I think the other thing to spill is that, you know. Um, Polk has traditionally always used soft dome tweeters, 
-hmm. So to answer the gentleman's question is that, you know, from the very beginning, Polk has always used soft dome tweeters and they've designed their own soft dome tweeters. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when Scott said, yeah, we experimented with, with, with uh, ribbon tweeters, it was, um, I wasn't there at the time, but obviously that was a departure from what they, they're accustomed to doing. So mm -hmm. the ring radiator tweeter was first introduced in um, the early 2000s with um, LS series. And so we're looking at the third generation of that. And when you look mm -hmm. at Polk, um, what you'll find is when you go throughout the speaker, you'll see that we're on our third or fifth or seventh generation of a technology. And part of it is because they found that it worked. And it also mm -hmm. produces the sound that is the Polk sound. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but every, like everything is a set of compromises. And at some point you just have to say it's time to go. And mm -hmm. so every time we go and do a new program, it's an opportunity to revisit that. And so the guys are always looking at how to make it better, right? They're never mm -hmm. satisfied. And so, but, but again, we're limited by things like time and money, right? And so mm -hmm. um, at some point you have to say, um, we believe this is the best it can be given where we're mm -hmm. at in this program. But they're always looking at improving it. And that's why when we talk about the tweeter, we're gonna talk about mm -hmm. the woofer, we're gonna talk about PowerPort. Mm -hmm. Each one of those is on its you know, third, fourth, fifth, seventh generation of, of, mm -hmm. of it because they continually try to improve it and make it better. So for example, um, uh, Scott, can you talk about what this uh, chart is showing you here? The graphs you see in front of you, those are what we call spectral decay plots. And what's going on there is uh, uh, in the, the I guess it's not the Z axis, but it would be the Y axis. Anyways, coming toward you is is time. And so each slice, there's a little frequency response at a certain point in time. And what this shows us is uh, if there's any sort of uh, resonance in the system, and resonance or ringing, as we might call it, will show up as kind of a line uh, mm -hmm. coming at you. And on the left, you can see there was uh, around two kilohertz or so there's a bit of a ringing going on and then on the right which is the new tweeter we we suppress that so by they're constantly um to working and working and working to eliminate all of these all of these types of, of things smoother frequency response overall that's the goal right um mm -hmm. so so what is going on in this particular um slide so here we have a uh, uh, an example of, of improvement over time. So the red curve that you're looking at is the uh, the new Pinnacle tweeter and the green curve is the LSIM tweeter. So you can see we got a little bit smoother response. We flattened things out a bit mm -hmm. and actually there's a little bit more sensitivity in there as well. Okay, and uh, and by the way, um, if you look the little dip at the at the end, what that frequency is what in, um, if you're a bat, you could probably yeah. <laughs> you could probably... So, so yeah, this this graph only goes out to 40k, and actually at 40k there's a little glitch because that's yeah. as far as the measurement system goes. These tweeters uh -huh. will actually go out farther than that. Exactly. So you know, it's it's pretty insane how far out in frequency yeah. they they'll go, and yeah. it's flat too. If you look at it, it's not like it's rolling off at 20 kilohertz. No, it's yeah. not rolling off until it hits. 35, 35 30, 40. something yeah, oh. something crazy out there. Well, we do have to say you can't if you're if you're a if you're a young person with very good hearing hearing you can maybe hear 20. Most of most most people um, as they as they age their frequent their ability to hear high frequencies diminish and uh, most people have are, are um, have a difficulty hearing a what what 15 16 and you could try that too. Go get the test tone from Spotify and play 20 and tell me what you hear, okay? A lot of times, many of you will hear nothing. It's beyond your actual um, hearing. There's the spec on the box and then there's reality. And, and right. we wanna, so look, Mike has a, a comment on that as well. Yeah, so if you look at that chart, I mean, let's talk about this in real world terms, right? You see the high res logo, mm -hmm. right? You see the high res logo on, on our speakers and so in order to get that logo approval we have to submit and we have to submit something that looks like this mm -hmm. for loudspeakers the high-res requirement says that you have to be able to play out to 40 kilohertz mm -hmm. now it actually and um it doesn't actually specify how far db down but if you think about it you can't actually hear that so what we've done is and if you look at this frequency response you can see at 20 it's still very flat at 
30. Um, it's got that one little dip and then it comes back out at 35. So it's well within the compliance. But this is an example of we know people are looking for that high res certification. And so in loudspeakers, that has nothing to do with file formats or any of the other things that are associated with high res. It has everything to do with being able to play out to 40 kilohertz. And so, uh, but again, just because it has that high res logo on it doesn't mean that it sounds great. Right. So, again, it goes back to the whole thing of you need to listen to the stuff. But we do that because we know that people care about that. And that's important to the consumer. And and we have done studies where we know that people won't, you know, that's part of their purchase decision. But at the end of the day, you can't hear it. But well, you, the meat and potatoes of the speaker in this, in the case of this tweeter is is kind of <laughs> like that, you know, 1K to 10K range, not the 40K yeah. range. Right. And so, you know, that so but again, so that's part of the reason why we always tell you go listen just because yeah, and, it, it, and it tells another, you so much more and this is another thing that little dip is if you look at it it's be, the each line is 5 db so um 85 is where the big line is and then 80 is the line below that is about 3 db that's it you know that's not a massive dip you could barely Correct. perceive that even if you wanted to and by the way if you think about this if you look see how flat that is i could have um, the, um, a frequency response where well, that pogo's up and down between those two big lines and still be plus or minus 3 dB and have the most jaggedy type of frequency response and I could still put plus or minus 3 dB on the box. So what did they, plus or minus 3 dB is a nice concept, but if if one's playing 3 dB up and another speaker's pl driver's playing 3 dB down, they're both plus or minus 3 dB but the characteristics are gonna be different. That's why I'm like, you can't just look at a spec on a box because it does not give you enough information to be um, actually realistic. So let's talk a little bit about the drivers as well because they look different. And, um, and I, I love this design, it's actually brilliant. So Scott, can you talk about the turbine cone driver? Well, yeah, so the turbine cone, the cone itself is, a, is another good example of, of what we try to accomplish in our innovation. And, and, and the case here is that cones uh, have what we call modes to them. There are frequencies at which the cone uh, wants to resonate uh, particularly. Uh, and what we're looking for is not resonate uh, resonating modes, but we want basically pistonic action, just mm -hmm. moving in and out. All, all the cone at one time. Mm -hmm. So what we've done with those features in that cone is we've stiffened up the cone along uh, uh, both axes, both the radial and axial uh, axes, because uh, if you look at a the way modes work, there are modes that start at the be at the center at the dust uh, the dust cap there or the voice coil, and they radiate outwards and inwards and there's ones that move around the cone in a circular pattern mm -hmm. so the ones that are moving outwards are being stiffened up by the pedals and 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 in the way that they are curled in space there they're not just lines they're going in to the side a bit mm -hmm. and the ones that go around the cone uh, happen in 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 multiples of two. The the nodes are in multiples of two, so you got a mode that's uh, you know plus on one side, minus on the other, and then you got one that's in quadrature. The features that are there are there's seven of them, and so that busts up that even uh, that even pattern and gets rid of those modes. So it, it ends up working quite well and pushes the the few remaining resonances out of the band so that we can deal with them uh, very easily in the crossover. Yeah, and um, and like I said, a lot of this stuff is, there's a lot going on in this driver. It was designed for this speaker. Um, this was not bought off the shelf. This was, they looked at all of the different goals they were trying to achieve, and they looked at the performance of the LSIM, and they said, how can I make it better? And what, what, what could I do? Because the biggest, I think one of the most expensive things when it comes to drivers is trying to balance stiffness and, and, and how light the driver is because the lightness helps with um, detail and clarity and dynamics, but, and, but if it's not stiff, you end up with resonances and distortion. So there's this fine balance and you could use some exotic material, right? To make it super stiff, 
like say for example scott what could you use a metal cone because that's light that's pretty light yeah and so and... Me metal cones are interesting because they're very stiff and you can use things like aluminum and such and they can be they can be light but the problem is is that they have very little what we call internal damping mm -hmm. so when they resonate they resonate a lot mm -hmm. and that's why things like bells are made out of metal so we don't want that type of resonance happening in our cones. Now, the material that the cone is made out of is kind of unique, too. Um, explain this foam core polymer thing, because I think this is kind of cool, too. Yeah, the foam core polymer is uh, really interesting stuff. So that's this uh, polymer uh, that's got these foaming agents in it. So mm -hmm. when we uh, inject that material into the, into the, um, uh, the mold, the outsides hit the mold and the mold is cooler, so they 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 cool and they, they create these skins. And you can see that in this picture here, the top and the bottom, it's solid at the top and the bottom. And then we pop open the, the mold just a little bit and the foaming agents inside, the gas expands mm -hmm. and makes the inside of that a, um, a mm -hmm. foam. So what you end up with is kind of a sandwich type design, but all out of the same material. So it's very, it's very, uh, it's a lot easier to to make. You don't have to glue things together and mm -hmm. things like that. So it ends up being very, it's it's thicker, so it's stiffer because thickness goes up with like third power with with uh, uh, stiffness goes up with mm -hmm. thickness like by the third power or something crazy like that. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> you get um, the internal damping that you want from the foam. And it, and it stays about the same weight as a regular polymer cone or even a little bit less because you've got all this air inside of it now. So it, yeah. it really does tick off all the boxes. Yeah. And even though it's the same material, it acts almost like two different materials. So they have different residences. So they cancel each other out. So there's a there's a lot of benefits there um, in this in this uh, in this technology. So can you really kind of explain what's going on in this chart, Scott? Sure. Sure. What you're looking at there is just a, a rough comparison of um, different types of cones. So the blue cone is a is a pretty typical uh, polypropylene cone, mm -hmm. and you can see it's pretty smooth through the pass band. It's got a little dip at 2K and then a bit of a resonance at 4K and rolls off. Now it's mm -hmm. you know this is a pretty decent loudspeaker cone. You can work mm -hmm. with it and make it you know, make it sound fairly good. The next mm -hmm. the green curve is uh, the same basically the same cone, but it's made out of the the foam core poly. Mm -hmm. And you can see already we've smoothed out uh, a lot of the same, a lot of those problems and we've pushed the resonances that exist out farther mm -hmm. in, in frequency where we can deal with them in the crossover. And then the red one, we've added the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the turbine features to it and you can see it's gotten even smoother if you look like between 3K and 5K, it's even smoother. Push the resonance out even a little bit farther, uh, so where we can deal with them with the crossover. So exactly. So I do want to point out that deal with, yeah, deal with it with the crossover. If this was a full range speaker designed to play from 20 to 20, then that peak would be a problem. Where do you normally cross a, um, a speaker over theoretically of this size? Do you think? Well, well, it depends on the the speaker and the tweeter it's matched with everything but it, you know typically it's somewhere in the two to three k k region you mean so, you mean like over here somewhere <laughs> yeah, one, one line over yeah like at the most right there right yeah that's 2k and so yeah. that's 2k the next one's 3k so usually somewhere in there but you got to remember exactly. these things they're, there's they're, it's not a brick wall right it doesn't yeah, just it rolls, off. 2K, it rolls off but it, it does it continues to make sound several octaves above so you you want to keep it as smooth as possible for at least a couple of octaves above above that point. Yeah. Now, so so, next... so Scott, so 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 Phil disappointed this. So when you think about the Polk sound, right? People will talk about the imaging, and they'll talk about how it has. Um, a, sometimes they'll describe it as a warm sound. Um, and there's there's a couple things that people always talk about. They talk about the bass response, and it always has big bass. But they also talk about amazing imaging and kind of this this warm sound and it's always generally a little bit forward right mm -hmm. and so a lot of that has to do with what's going on with this mid-range cone that we're using mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how they're and how it's being voiced and so it, it it's not just can i get a flat response but it's mm -hmm. also again you know trying to be true to what is that sound and mm -hmm. um 
it's it's not that the sound is being colored or something along those lines, but there's certain aspects of the sound that when you talk to people that have owned Polk speakers and they bought multiple Polk speakers, they always will refer to it the same way or very similarly. And so that's part of what you're seeing here. So we're trying to get that smooth response, but then when they go to the voicing aspect of it, we get that nice, um, that really nice mid-range tones, that really nice imaging, and a lot of it has to do with 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 what you're seeing on screen there. Yeah. Can you talk about just developing the cone and the shape, um, all of the mm -hmm. stuff you had to do to do that. Yeah, so again, we've been using this type of material since uh, the early 2000s with uh, the LSI line. So this is actually, again, it's the third generation of this, uh, this type of cone. And we did a lot of, uh, as you can see here in this slide, we did a lot of finite element analysis to try to tune those uh, those features that we added to it. And, mm -hmm. and here you see a, a perfect example of, of the good it's doing. So mm -hmm. on the left, you're seeing um, a, a, a mode in the cone. The, you've got red, which means it's moving outwards, blue, which means it's moving inwards. And you can see the, it's not moving all together, right? There's a ring that's trying to move outwards and there's a ring that's trying to move inwards and there's stuff in the middle that's kind of staying still because it's being fought fought at on both sides so that's non-pistonic motion that's mm -hmm. resonance we don't want that exactly. and if you go to the to the right there you can see you can even tell where the the features are in there because it makes this tiny pattern there but it's all mostly moving in the same direction now it's mostly blue there's a little bit of resonance here and there but it's been suppressed by quite a bit so that's exactly. that's the whole point of those features yeah, cause, um, because one of the things, too, that I always want to stress, if you have a tweeter, it's itty-bitty and super light, and it's it can move back and forth really, really quickly. You take a big cone, and you lob it into the room, and now you got to stop it and pull it back, that's when there's a problem. So the bigger the driver gets, the harder it is to control its motion. Go buy a shake weight. We have these things called a shake weight. And, and try to keep control of that thing. And that's an example of weight. When you have a bigger um, object with more weight maintaining control, that voice coil has to stop that cone and pull it back. And sometimes the cone wants to continue to go on. And that's where you get your red and blue rings. And if the cone does not respond like it should, that's going to affect your dynamics, your, the, um, the, the clarity of what you're listening to. It has a big impact on it. You see the cone on the driver, but there's some other things about that driver that you do not see that helps it move pistonically. And in a and one of them is the dual spiders. You don't see these in the in the midwoofers. And I think we need to make sure that we actually talk about these because this is another example of us building to our specs to get the what we need out of a speaker. So can you talk about the dual opposed um, the dual opposed spiders? Sure. Um, yeah. So. Uh, one of the things we like to talk about is, is you know, how much do things matter? What matters in the design of the loudspeaker? And the answer is everything matters, mm -hmm. but then it's a matter of degree. So mm -hmm. how much can you improve something and um, spend the right amount of money to do it? In this case, we, we've got what are what we're calling the dual spiders. And the reason we use those is it does a couple of things. One is it improves uh, the linearity by um, the fact that one, the spiders are kind of in a push-pull arrangement. Mm -hmm. So any any uh, non-linearities in one is counteracted by the, the same thing in the other one, but in opposite polarity. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a balanced design in, a, in an amplifier or something. You can think of it that way. <laughs> And the other thing is, is it gives another moment to the to the motion and keeps the the, the voice coil moving uh, in and out properly, so you get less chance of any kind of rocking or or buzzing or anything in there. So yeah, this is so this is an example of things that you see and things that you don't. The next thing is that I want to talk about is the power port. Looks like a little Hershey's kiss at the bottom of the um that you'll find on the on the speakers like on the larger ones it's normally found on the at the bottom or on a subwoofer it's normally found um below and on the speaker like a bookshelf it's normally found in the rear can you talk about what the power port is yeah so the power port design is there to uh reduce turbulence in the port 
and specifically situations like you see with that tower loudspeaker where we're mm -hmm. firing downwards mm -hmm. and we're going to hit the floor if we don't do something to it so what we do is we use the uh the internal flare of the port tube and the what you're calling the hershey's kiss or we call the diffuser mm -hmm. and the base to uh create a turn in the air that is uh, reduces turbulence by the by the most. In fact, if you look mathematically at it, it has a constant cross section that is grows as it goes out. So it's not mm -hmm. just blasting out from the center. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what that does is it 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 promotes laminar flow, mm -hmm. and so we get less turbulence in the port. And that's a nice cutaway of it. So that there, depending on the design, there may actually be one on the inside as well. Mm -hmm. In this case, we just have the internal flare, but um, that's all part of making the port have as little turbulence as possible. And it makes a huge difference mm -hmm. when you're trying to play low frequencies at, at significant levels. You can definitely hear that a port working too hard and making noise. So we 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 try to extend the range of the port in, in level such that you notice that at a much, much higher level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so when did we? When did you? When did Polk start utilizing the power port? Because it, because like you said, it's so it, it's it, evolution. So yeah, it about? came about um, with the design of the SRT system, the Signature mm -hmm. Reference Series, mm -hmm. and what happened was Matthew was uh, working on the subwoofer for that uh, that tower, mm -hmm. and he had this big cabinet, and he wanted to have a really large port so that it had as little uh, air velocity in it as possible. And he found that, well, if I get it tuned to where I need it to be tuned in frequency, it doesn't, I can't have it in the box anymore. It can't fire mm -hmm. front, to back, uh, to front to back. So he's like, well, now I have to go up and down. But if I do that, I'm blasting into the floor. Mm -hmm. So he developed this to, to deal with that. And that was the beginning of power port. But they continue to enhance that power port. And and just little things like the little subtle things that you don't see, like the like the radius, they continue to evolve to make the air smoother and the uh, the response smoother and smoother and smoother. Yeah. Because so with the the HTS line of subwoofers, mm -hmm. we had worked quite a bit on the power port design because obviously with the subwoofer, the mm -hmm. port's doing a lot of the work, right? And so exactly. you want to get that. Uh, as good as possible and we learned a few things about how to design the flare mm -hmm. in the in that and we took that information and we put it into legend mm -hmm. yeah and um because one of the things that uh jim a um mr crowley are you there jim does a great demo showing the the advantages of the power port using um hts 12 subwoofers can you talk about that jim i think that's pretty cool the way that you do that demo well there's two things i do with those <clears throat> excuse me one, I use a tone generator to show that specs aren't really specs, so uh -huh. to speak, like Scott was saying earlier, and mm -hmm. show how much bass these things actually produce and how mm -hmm. low they go. But mm -hmm. then you can you can A, B it with a conventional woofer that has mm -hmm. a conventional port, and mm -hmm. you can hear the port noise, which mm -hmm. is actually, I mean, literally hear it mm -hmm. compared to the power port, which has virtually no port noise. Mm -hmm. um, and just by playing some demanding material. And that's usually a pretty effective demo for power port. So a lot of times when we talk about these speakers, we talk a lot about the, like I said, the, the tweeter, the woofer, the cabinet. But there's a lot of, uh, there's some other components, like when you hear the term voicing that has um, a big impact on the sound. And this is the stuff that a lot of people don't realize is really, really critical to its overall, to a speaker's overall performance. So can you talk about the crossover design? Sure. So crossover design actually is one of the, the most finicky parts of designing the crossover. And it's actually one of the most fun because I get to do a lot of listening at this stage. Mm -hmm. And, um, so the crossover is there for a, mul for a multitude of reasons. Some of it is is to 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 tune the actual speaker. Some of it is to protect certain um, things like the tweeter. You don't want it to play low frequencies that it can't do anyways. Mm -hmm. So there's all these different factors that come into balance here. Mm -hmm. And the principles behind how we choose uh, what to do is, you know, first of all, we're going to try to use as many or as few components as we can to meet our sonic goals for that product. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so, you know, every time I want to add a part, which, you know, if you give any loudspeaker engineer enough time, he'll add a, a gazillion parts to a crossover to fix every little thing that he can. Um, you have to ask, is that part really making enough difference to justify its existence in that signal? in that in that crossover or is it is it actually causing problems so that's a that's a big part of crossover design um, the other thing is to do the same sort of analysis with the materials so crossover components can have uh, quite a few different um, grades of components especially like capacitors you've got polypropylenes and polyester and, and electrolytics and stuff so if i go in there and i say okay i've got a certain budget for this crossover, and I, but I would really like to have this, you know, really expensive capacitor on my tweeter. Okay, I can have that, but now I have to get rid of parts elsewhere, which mm -hmm. might actually have a, a, a bigger uh, effect on the sound. And you know, maybe we don't want to do that. So all every every part of the com every component that's in there and every bit of the materials that are used on the comp they're all being considered while we're doing the voicing. Yeah, and I think I like to think of of Scott as almost like a chef, um, a master chef. If I tell a chef that they have a certain budget or a certain thing, they have to make a meal, a dish, for a certain amount. That, that this is how much you have to a, a funds to make this dish. I have to pick the ingredients, the spices, and all of the other things to get the most to make the most amazing dish for that particular. For that particular um for that particular cost or budget and sometimes you may want to spend for the truffle um the extra truffles but if i spend for the extra truffles the cut of the meat can't be as may not be as high of a grade or or the side dish has to be um less elaborate so it, it's always this goal the goal is to look at the resources that he is given the time that he is given and utilize and all of the different tools he has spices and ingredients he has in his toolbox to give you the best dish possible and it and that's what separates a um the best audio engineers and from the the also rands is who can make the best dishes with the budgets that they are assigned phil i just want to add something i think one of the challenges we have is we live in a world today where everybody's asking what's the best right mm -hmm. we reviewers and everybody's like what's the best what's the best and then we also look to things like oh is this the latest right mm -hmm. I, I, it's almost like the gentleman was asking about the ribbon tweeter and why are you doing this or doing that and mm -hmm. the reality is is that this is not an iphone right this is mm -hmm. not like oh i want a version 11 because it has this screen and this processor mm -hmm. this is a little bit of it's a combination of art and science right mm -hmm. so we, we talk a lot about the science today where we measure things, but at the end of the day, this is very much uh, an art as well. And mm -hmm. it's and and what might measure well or look good on paper does not mean mm -hmm. it sounds good. And so mm -hmm. uh, that's the thing that I think that, that people struggle with is because they're always saying, well, what's the best? You know, mm -hmm. why aren't you using this latest and greatest whatever that's out there? And it's mm -hmm. not like a computer or a phone or a screen like a like a TV screen where you're like, oh, I want the 4K with the HDR plus and the eight or the 8K. Mm -hmm. It's not like that because it's more it's there's a lot of it that's art and science. And so we talk about trade offs and it's not just about trade offs in terms of cost and performance. It's not that's it. But it's also this art form of how do you put all these pieces together? Because there isn't. A, a, like one formula for making a loudspeaker. If there was, there would not be the choices that are in the market. There's exactly. hundreds of speakers, right? And if there was only one way to make a loudspeaker, right? If you know, putting the tweeter below, putting the tweeter above, doing an MTM design, doing it with this material, then everybody would do it and they would all sound the same. But that's mm -hmm. but that's the fun part, right? You, you equate this to food and being a chef, and mm -hmm. it's not just about the cost of the ingredients and it's about the quality of the ingredients, but it's also about the imagination of that chef to put those ingredients together to get mm -hmm. something that excites your palate. In this case, it's about a speaker designer putting together all these different materials to get you to have this immersive experience. And so when we go back to the purpose of this webinar was to talk about the design philosophy we go back to the original thought of it is this immersive experience and it's about how we put all these different pieces together that might mm -hmm. seem very clinical and very technical but it's mm -hmm. again it's an art form another big ingredient that has an impact on on how a speaker sounds is the cabinet that it's in um 
the exterior of the cabinet has an impact. Like Scott, why are the edges, like if you look at the front baffle, it's kind of, it's kind of the edges around it. So why do you do that? So yeah, the, the rounded edges are to help reduce cabinet diffraction. And cabinet diffraction is one of those uh, necessary evils of loudspeaker design um, that we have to deal with uh, regardless of the, the, the speaker we're putting together. And what cabinet diffraction is, is Imagine, imagine the tweeter as a as a as a radiating source, which it is, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. Sounds going everywhere as it leaves the tweeter, right? It's not mm -hmm. just going forward at us; it's actually going to the sides as well. Mm -hmm. And what happens is it moves across the face of the the cabinet. Mm -hmm. It encounters the edge of the the cabinet, and mm -hmm. what happens there is what we call there's a change in acoustic radiation and uh, acoustic impedance and any change in impedance results in a reflection mm -hmm. so when you get to that edge there's a small reflection that happens at those edges and those reflections become secondary sound sources mm -hmm. and can blur imaging can create resonances and and frequency response anomalies and so what you would like to do is to smooth those out and make make that transition as gradual as possible mm -hmm. now it's a, it's very expensive to build a, a speaker that looks like an egg. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> you know, when we're we're in the world of box loudspeakers, mm -hmm. you, there's there's only so much you can do to the to the to the face of the speaker. So, rounding the edges is one of the things that we can do yeah. to help alleviate yeah. that yep. diffraction problem. The box should make should not make a sound too. The, what should be making the, generating the sound in your room should not be the sides of the cabinet and um, it should be the actual drivers that are in it. You took all the care to build the drivers. We got to make sure the box does it, doesn't sing along with the, um, the, the, the drivers that are in the box. So that comes up to the amount of bracing and, um, and all that stuff. And you test and all that to determine even um, um, the bracing and, and where should yep. that bracing be, correct? Sure, we do uh, some finite element analysis of the cabinet design to see uh, where we think we should put braces. And some of that is 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 that finite element design. Some of it's just uh, we've been building speakers for 40 years, so we kind of know where they need to go a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, and then we build a prototype, and then we'll measure it with a, a laser vibrometer mm -hmm. and see you know if it all worked out. If it didn't, then we'll go back and, and fix it up a little bit and, you know, rinse and repeat until we get uh, what we're looking for. Add What's interesting that it's not just the internal bracing. Mm -hmm. If you look at like, uh, for example, that L, uh, L200, is that what you have there? Y yes, sir. Uh, the, the power port diffuser on the back, mm -hmm. that also went under underwent quite a bit of design because as you can see, it's a little bit larger than you some of the older designs. Well, as it gets larger, that surface area can can itself become a, a resonating mm -hmm. body and so we spent a lot of time working on different bracing schemes for, for just the diffuser itself if you look at the back of the diffusers there's this kind of x pattern on it mm -hmm. that's uh, new to the to the design for for legend so yeah we look at all of those like i said everything matters it's it's amazing how every little thing even the trim ring around mm -hmm. the woofer mm -hmm. we had to work on that and the, the, <laughs> the gaskets that's behind it and how it interfaces with the cabinet face. It's just amazing how every little decision that's made in every loudspeaker really does make a difference with the acoustics. So we just want to show people that um, there are some, there's a lot of unique technologies. A lot of them you can just straight see when you walk up to a, to a poke speaker, and, but there's a lot of care that goes into the things that you do not see. Now, um, there is one more thing then we're gonna have a whole session on it um, a little later, but Mike's gonna give you a teaser. Mike and Scott are gonna give you a teaser about an exclusive technology that, that they uh, actually have uh, brought, um, decided to bring back into the Poke lineup when it comes to the Legend speaker. So, um, so you have three minutes, <laughs> three minutes. to give us so, a, a short yeah. summary of what SPA Pro is. 
Right. So just to kind of just to frame all this, right? So we've talked a lot about technology, but we don't throw technology into speakers for the sake of that, right? That's very different than we talked about like with TVs or phones. Everything we do is to solve an acoustic problem. So everything Scott's talked about is how do I give you that immersive experience and solve an acoustic problem? And you can see that Polk has been very true to its roots and it's carried through these things it's been doing for years and continuing to evolve them. One of the things that Polk is very well known for and introduced it in 1984 called SDA. And um, I'll let Scott speak a little bit more about what SDA is, but you'll notice that this pair of floor standing speakers is very unusual because it has dual tweeters and dual uh, mid-range woofers. And that is, be that is because this is an SDA enabled speaker. And from 1984 to about 1997, where we talked about the SRTs, um, the, all the flagship speakers from Polk had SDA built into them. There were basically two lines. There was the SDA line, and then there was the monitor series. And the SDA line was the flagship line. Because of a whole host of reasons, 97 was kind of the last time we made a commercially available SDA speaker. Um, during the development of Legend, the guys also had new patents that were related to SDA, and there were new um, ideas upon how to actually improve upon SDA and also make it more accessible to everybody. So when we were building the new flagship line for Polk, the thought was we need to bring SDA back. And so that's why in the in the Legend series, you have the very the flagship floor standing speaker has SDA built in. And th at the end of the day, what SDA does is it takes Polk's imaging and puts it on steroids. Um, mm -hmm. it, is th it is the most lifelike imaging you'll, you'll ever hear. Now, adding SDA to a speaker doesn't make it a good speaker. You have to start with mm -hmm. good ingredients. And so I will comment that you'll notice at the top of this floor standing speaker, the tweeter mid-range is the exact same tweeter mid-range in that L100 in the small bookshelf that Phil's been showing throughout this uh, webinar. And so the idea is you have to start with a really good loudspeaker. And then when you add SDA, you 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 basically are getting this imaging that you get from SDA, but just adding SDA to something doesn't make it a good loudspeaker. We could spend an hour on this, but yeah. we're just gonna give you kind of the, the why it works. I mean, what it is and what's the overall benefit. So SDA, uh, it stands for stereo dimensional array. So it, the, it's just referring to, you've, you've got two arrays in each speaker. Mm -hmm. So when I mean, you get a stereo pair, it's kind of like buying four speakers. Mm -hmm. um, and what SDA is, is it's a form of interaural crosstalk cancellation. Mm -hmm. And interaural crosstalk is the phenomenon of, let's say we were listening to the left speaker. The left speaker mm -hmm. plays, goes through the air, plays to our left ear, but it also wraps around our head and plays to our right ear. Mm -hmm. uh, that sound just, there's like no barrier to that. So that sound that's going to our right ear is what we call interaural crosstalk. And that's just the kind of uh, distortion uh, in stereo reproduction that we've, uh, that we've lived with since basically the, the invention of stereo. Mm -hmm. Now what SDA does is that dimensional array sends uh, a cancellation signal to the opposite ear to cancel that crosstalk. Mm -hmm. And when it does that, what ends up happening is your, uh, your ear brain mechanism can no longer locate the loudspeakers in mm -hmm. space. And so the imaging goes from, you know, being locked to between the loudspeakers to becoming this enormous, wide, deep, detailed uh, spatial presentation. Yeah. And, and it, it, it does an amazing job. We're going to spend a we're going to I'm going to bring Scott and Mike back to talk about SDA. The soundstage, the imaging is just amazing. Um, they're not they're just as easy. There's not. They're not super hard to set up. They're not super hard to place. Um, by eliminating something that should not have been in the signal, you end up with a better stereo or movie experience. Um, these are spectacular speakers for not only um, stereo representation, but also as a movie speaker. In fact, there's even a height uh, module for those people who are Adobe Atmos and DTSX fans um, that you can add, um, seamlessly integrate into the large towers. But we just wanted to take some time and talk about the Legend series. And I do want to thank um, Scott and, and Mike for coming today and, 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 and um, answering some of these questions. Hopefully you have a better understanding of what 
makes a um, poke speaker and what is behind the minds of those that designed them. We, we wanna say thank you um, very much for coming. And of course, I wanna thank the people that always help us get through this every, every week. And that includes Frederick, um, Jen, and Jennifer. So I'd like to say um, good night or good morning or good afternoon. And, and Frederick can now go to bed. So take care <laughs> and we will talk to you soon.